Good morning. This is Deb Van Dyke Reese, and I'm the director of the Nebraska Port Improvement Project. And I want to thank you for and welcome you uh, for uh, listening in on the legislative update for juvenile justice and child welfare by Christine Penningson and Sarah Helby. Uh, just a few small uh, uh, housekeeping items. So on the top right-hand side, you will see uh, four different files that are available for download, uh, one of which is the presentation and then some additional handouts that Christine and uh, Sarah have provided. And um, also, I wanted you to know that we are recording this uh, webinar, and it will be available on our website. Um, just so you know, our website has moved, and we are part of the State of Nebraska Judicial Branch website. Um, and so you can find us on that, uh, that web page. But we are the, under the Programs and Services tab and the third option on the left side. But if you just Google CIP or Court Improvement Project, it uh, will redirect you to our new website. So with that, I would like to do just quick introductions of both Sarah and Christine. Sarah Helvey is the Program Director and Staff Attorney of the Child Welfare Program at Nebraska Appleseed, and Christine Henningsen is the Director of the Nebraska Youth Advocates. So I want to thank them for their time today and sharing an update on the Juvenile Justice and Child Welfare legislation for 2017. And I will turn it over to Sarah and Christine. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Deb. Um, yeah, so my name is, that is Christine Henningsen, um, and I am the director of a program called Nebraska Youth Advocates. Um, we're a project that's operated out of UNL, Center on Children, Families, and the Law, and we're really focused on giving juvenile defense attorneys the tools they need to zealously advocate on behalf of their clients. Um, prior to joining CCFL, I practiced in the Public Defender's Office in Omaha, Nebraska, primarily in juvenile court. Um, we promote fairness, responsibility, and respect is cut off there at the bottom. <laughs> but it's very important. <laughs> Great. Um, and this is Sarah Helvey. And as Deb said, I'm a staff attorney and director of the Child Welfare Program in Nebraska Appleseed. Um, and Appleseed is a nonprofit, nonpartisan um, uh, legal ad public interest legal advocacy organization. For all the times I've said that, I just bungled it. Um, but we work in the areas, in addition to child welfare, of healthcare access, immigration, and poverty or public benefits advocacy. Um, and we like to say that we use all of the tools in the advocacy toolkit, so we do a lot of work at the legislature, which we'll be talking about today, um, doing policy advocacy work, and in the community doing grassroots organizing. Um, but we also have attorneys, and we do legal advocacy as well, including impact litigation. And then we also have what we call our Foster Care Reform Legal Resource Center, where we provide technical assistance and other resources like um, amicus briefs and legal research to attorneys to help them create more positive precedents in juvenile court cases and in turn to help us identify the needs on the ground for systemic policy change. So if you're an attorney practicing in juvenile court and you'd like to join our listserv, um, you know, feel free to email me. My email's in the, at the end of the PowerPoint, I think. Um, and feel free to please reach out to us anytime if um, you have a systemic issue that arises in your practice and we can be of assistance. So with that intro to our organization, we wanted to start out by giving just a little background on the legislative session, a little legislative session 101. Um, so each year, the legislature convenes over a two-year period called the biennium. Um, and the first year of the biennium is the long session, and that runs 90 legislative days from January through June. There's obviously some recess days in there. Um, and then the second year of the biennium is the short session, and that's 60 legislative days and typically runs from January through April. Um, this year was the first session of the 105th legislature, and the legislature adjourned a little early. Um, they call it adjourned sine die, and they adjourned this year on May 23rd. So then all bills without an emergency clause then go into effect three calendar months after the legislature adjourns. So 
August 23rd. Um, and then bills that were not indefinitely postponed or sometimes it's called killed by the committee remain, and then those can be taken up during the second or short session of the, of the legislature, which will start for us in January of 2018. Um, so today we'll be talking about um, both bills that are past the session and those that remain um, and may be taken up in January. Which leads into the next slide, which is kind of a roadmap of what we'll be talking about today. Um, we're going to start with the budget, which you all probably heard in reading the paper and media during the session. It was a difficult budget year. Um, it continues to be. So we're going to mention a few of the changes to the state budget that affect funding for travel for and juvenile justice. We're just going to start tackling that first. Um, and give you an update there. And then we're going to go through, go to a little higher note, bills that pass the session. And we'll talk about um, several child welfare bills, and I'll take the lead on that. And then Christine will talk about several juvenile justice bills that pass the session. And then, as I said, we'll talk about some bills that remain either in committee or on the floor that could be taken up when the legislature reconvenes in January. Again, I'll talk about the child welfare bills, and um, Christine will talk about the juvenile justice bills. And then, we're currently in the interim, so the period between when the legislature convenes, um, adjourns, and reconvenes, so right now, um, kind of in the summer and fall, um, that's the interim. And so senators can each introduce interim studies, which is a chance for the legislature to sort of study an issue. It often lays the groundwork for a bill in the future, but not always. So we will um, highlight some interim studies that were introduced, again, on the juvenile justice and child welfare side. You can see um, in the, I guess, file section, the upper right here of the Adobe, there are some resources. That is our um, the presentation itself that we're clicking through. That's the PDF, so it has a little bit better formatting. It, didn't look, it doesn't look like this in our version, so that one's the pretty version. So you can believe us that we put together <laughs> prettier slides, um, and you can have it as a resource. And then also in the files um, are, is a chart of the interim studies, that's the chart CW interim studies. It also includes JJ um, 2017. And then there's a chart of all of the bills that our organizations were tracking um, and where they ended at the end of the final actions for the first session. Um, so we're not going to be talking about all of the bills on that chart, but there's additional bills on there um, for you to reference if you'd like. And with that, we'll jump right into it, starting with the, the budget. And I'll hand it over to Christine to talk about the juvenile justice side. Yeah, so like Sarah said, we're starting off on a high note. The budget, it was a tough budget year this year. Just wanted to highlight a few um, things that affect the juvenile justice population. Um, right at the end there, the, uh, the governor had line item vetoed a um, $300,000 for $300,000 for probation services, um, and the legislature failed to override that veto. So that um, cut was made to their budget, and that was for all probation services. I know probation had also put in for some provider rate increases that was not um, adopted into the budget. Um, but really, there were less cuts than was originally an anticipated, so, um, so it was better than it could have been. Um, also, just some great news, too, um, from the, the Crime Commission, you know, they're responsible for um, dispersing the community-based aid grants. Um, and the great news to report there is there will be no effect on the money that is available to counties through the community-based aid. Um, there was some cuts to juvenile services grants, um, which was about $540,000 that was available through the Crime Commission. There were some cuts to that program, um, but obviously the, the biggest bulk um, is that community-based aid, so great news that that was not affected. Also, um, the legislature did not pass a bill which would provide for loan assistance for attorneys who are practicing in rural areas. Um, but that only affects the loan forgiveness. The NSBA, the Nebraska State Bar Association, still is going great guns with their rural practice initiative, and as well as UNL's law schools, still has their rural legal opportunities programs. 
Um, also, there were some budget increases to improve staffing ratios at the youth re rehabilitation and treatment centers. Um, a lot of those are to comply with um, federal legislation, PREA, the Pre or Prison Rape Elimination Act. Great. Um, and then on the child welfare side, um, that, so the governor originally proposed a total of $16 million in cuts to child welfare. Um, that, that included reducing three kind of main buckets, reducing um, the general fund appropriation for provider contracts by 2.2%, a 50% cut to contracted foster and kinship placement services. So that's the um, child agencies in the community, like CEDARS, for example, that provide support to foster and kinship placements. Um, bring a, a cut to that to bring that in-house with an HHS, and then um, eliminating Right Turn, which provides post-guardianship and adoptive services um, to children that have been adopted or guardianship from the child welfare system. That program was created after the safe haven crisis. Um, these cuts were concerning, in particular, at Appleseed, because we and other advocates, we were and remain very concerned about HHS having the capacity to take this work in-house. Um, to support those foster and kinship providers, um, given that HHS workers are already over their statutory caseload standards. Um, the Appropriations Committee, the way the process works then, the Appropriations Committee um, takes the governor's recommendation and um, creates a budget. They sent to the legislature a budget that, that minimized some of those cuts that were proposed by the governor. Um, so in particular, the Appropriations budget held flat the provider contracts and didn't eliminate right turn. And that was passed by the legislature. Um, so the legislature sent the governor a balanced budget, and he made additional cuts, primarily many, to children and families, um, particular to child welfare. The governor vetoed the provider right recommendations of the Appropriations Committee, and that veto was sustained, so the override was not successful, resulting in kind of back to the beginning, the 2.2% decrease in provider rates. However, HHS has indicated that they can save money by streamlining some of their drug testing, um, the company that they work with, so that they are, have maintained that provider rates won't be impacted. Um, the veto on the kinship contracts was also sustained. And I would say the bright spot is that the right turn contract was protected. Um, so in all, as, as Bo said, it was a, a difficult budget year for children and families, and I think um, we all need to be diligent in the system moving forward and advocating for the rights and needs of our clients in light of this moving forward. And, you know, we're all sort of watching the forecasting and projections, um, you know, to see how things look moving forward and what, where we might be, whether the legislature would have to go into special session on the budget um, and what and or what next year will look like. So, um, you know, continuing monitor, I think, and advocacy is needed in this area. Um, okay, so moving to over to the more positive uh, number of bills on the child welfare side did pass this session. Um, and the first one on the child welfare side that we'll be discussing is LB 180. Um, and this is a bill that creates a procedure for a bridge order um, in situations where a non-custodial parent has been determined fit to safely care for a child, but there's still a pending juvenile court case. So the bill permits, upon the motion of a, a legal parent or the juvenile court's own motion, or under an amendment, the GAL, um, upon motion for a bridge order transferring jurisdiction over a juvenile's custody, physical care, and visitation to the district court, and terminating the juvenile court's jurisdiction under 3A. Um, the process under the bill is that, upon motion, the juvenile court must set it for an evidentiary hearing within 30 to 90 days, unless um, under an amendment that all parties stipulate. And then such an order is permitted under the bill if all of the following criteria are met. There's an active juvenile court case that has been adjudicated 3A and it's post disposition. Um, paternity has been established. The, ch the juvenile has been safely placed by the juvenile court with a legal parent. And the juvenile court has determined that its jurisdiction should properly end once the orders are entered in the district, are entered in the district court. Um, and the order um, the bill specifies that the order shall only address matters of legal and physical custody and parenting time, which under an amendment, um, the district court is required to give full force and effect. 
following the issuance of a bridge order, a party may file a modification petition in the district court. If the modification um, is filed within one year of the bridge order, the party requesting the modification is only required to show that the modification is in the best interest of the child rather than demonstrate a substantial change in circumstances given sort of the changes in the standards. Um, also, if it's filed within a year, filing fees and court costs are not assessed against the parties. Um, this bill was introduced by Senator Kate Bowles, and it was a key recommendation of the Legal Parties Task Force under the Nebraska Children's Commission. And the intent here um, was to you know, minimize unnecessary cases and um, duplicitous jurisdiction. Um, moving on, the next bill that um, the past session that we want to talk about is LB 225. Um, and it was introduced by Senator Crawford. And as amended, permits HHS to continue um, the use of AR, oh, sorry, alternative response statewide. Um, alternative response, of course, is the model Nebraska is using under a demonstration project under our federal Title IV e waiver that permits families um, that are determined to be low risk um, to enter into kind of a more non-adversarial alternative response and not to be placed on the central registry. So, the bill would permit HHS to, to continue that statewide um, and requires HHS to provide a report to the Nebraska Children's Commission and the HHS Committee of the Legislature by November 15th of 2018, outlining the challenges, barriers, and opportunities that may occur if um, the AR implementation plan is made permanent. It also permits child advocacy centers in addition to law enforcement and county attorneys to receive reports of um, child abuse or ne child abuse or neglect cases receiving AR, and then this was kind of a big package. This was like the child welfare Christmas tree bill, I guess, as we like to say. Um, this bill was, a, I think, the personal priority of Senator Crawford, um, and then it um, several other child welfare bills were amended onto it, including LB 297, LB 298, and LB 336, which I will discuss now in turn. Um, Okay, so the first one, LB 298, was originally introduced by Senator McAllister, and it created the Children and Juvenile Data Feasibility Study Advisory Group, um, basically to make sure that all systems that serve kids can better utilize data and potentially establish an independent data warehouse. Also amended into LB 225 was LB 298, which was originally introduced by Senator Baker. Um, as originally introduced, LB 298 um, would have applied the provisions of the Nebraska Strengthening Families Act with regard to the reasonable and prudent parent standard, so the access to normalcy activities um, to youth in juvenile justice placements. And this was a key recommendation of the Normalcy Task Force under the Nebraska Children's Commission. Um, following a hearing, uh, the hearing on the bill and discussions with probation, the bill was amended to, um, to not apply that broadly to the juvenile justice population, um, but to focus on a narrow piece that would require child care institutions, which are essentially group homes or congregate care facilities that serve juvenile justice youth to develop normalcy plans as part of their contracts annually, um, and that those normalcy plans outline things like how they will implement uh, normalcy in their setting. So efforts to provide and address barriers to normalcy in that setting, policy on staffing supervision and participation to, for youth in their care to participate in normalcy activities, so a list of activities that the facilities can provide on site and in the community that the facility can support. There's a list of things that that plan um, is to include. Um, so really kind of an effort to have normalcy within those settings, but to allow the providers themselves to say how they can make that happen and to have um, some reporting on that. The bill also requires HHS to develop regulations on training for foster parents on human trafficking. Um, and then there are two provisions in the bill that would permit the dissemination of a photo of an information about a state ward missing from care consistent with confidentiality statutes. And both of those last two were the result of a lot of work by the trafficking subcommittee of the Normalcy Task Force of the Nebraska Children's Commission, um, looking at best practices around youth missing from care and the prevention of trafficking. And then finally, if you can see it there, um, LB 336 was originally introduced by Senator Reedy at the request of the governor. 
Um, and that one permits HHS to charge a reasonable fee in an amount set out in regs to recover expenses in carrying out central registry checks. And the bill specifies that the fee is not to exceed $3 for each request to check the records. And then that fee may also be waived by the requesting party if the requesting party shows an undue financial hardship. And then finally, um, LB188 was introduced by Senator Howard. That was later amended into LB289, which was approved by the governor. Um, this exempts a bio parent convicted of sexual assault from the definition of family for purposes of requiring reasonable efforts. Um, it states that if a child is conceived, it also states that if a child is conceived by a victim of a sexual assault, a TPR petition shall be granted if the termination is one in the child's best interest and the perpetrator has been convicted, pled guilty, or no context of sexual assault, or the perpetrator has been found to have fathered or given birth to the child as a result of sexual, um, the sexual assault. Um, the bill that served as a vehicle for LB-188, LB-289, was introduced by Senator Panzing Brex. Um, and among other things, increases criminal penalties for trafficking and defines trafficking to include solicitation, solicitation of trafficking. Great. Um, Thank okay. you. And, yep. Yep. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. So we'll over. Okay. Um, so we're going to go through some of the major juvenile justice bills that, that passed this session as well. Um, the first one, uh, LB 207, that'll affect um, child welfare populations as well. Um, it's primarily concerned with the Office of Inspector General of Child Welfare. Um, the Office of Inspector of Child Welfare does an annual report each September to the legislature. Um, but this bill provides that um, in the interim, the OIG may um, release summarize reports to bring awareness to particular issues um, within the child welfare or juvenile justice system. Um, what it's LV6 says um, is that uh, once OIG writes this report before dissemination to the public, it must be approved by either the chairperson of the Health and Human Services Committee or the Judiciary Committee. Um, if there's disagreement, the chairman of the executive committee of the legislature would be the determining vote whether that report would be released. Um, also, uh, within that bill, it made some minor changes relating to the powers and duties of the Office Inspector of Child Welfare. Um, specifically, it said in there that the Office of Inspector General is not responsible for any attorney's fees. If during their investigation they're interviewing someone who wants to have an attorney present, the Office of Inspector General is not responsible for paying that person's attorney's fees. Um, also includes in there, too, employers cannot take adverse action against their employees for disclosures that are made during the course of investigation to the Inspector General. Um, LB8 was really the what the bill with the most meat and will affect the day-to-day -day, um, operations uh, most directly for youth who are on probation. Uh, there is a handout there in the file folder in the right-hand corner, which provides a section summary. Um, but LB8 was introduced by Senator Chris. It came out of the um, Juvenile Detentions Alternative Initiative uh, Committee as well. There was um, broad support for it. Basically, it updates the statutory framework uh, governing administrative sanctions for youth. There was a provision in the code that allowed for sanctions, but it modeled the adult criminal uh, code. And so really, this was uh, reworking it to make it more developmentally appropriate um, and applicable to youth. Um, so what it does is allows probation officers to provide incentives for good behavior while on probation to help um, increase compliance with probation orders and also to respond to minor violations of probation using a um, standardized graduated response matrix. 
Now, probation is in the process of developing that matrix. The bill does provide that it is to be developed with stakeholder input. Uh, so they're in the process of, of developing it, and then they'll release it to um, different groups for, for comment um, and for development before it's actually implemented. Um, once it is implemented, the Office of Probation Administration is to provide training on the same to all the probation officers, initial training and then also continuing training um, for the use, with the use of it. Um, it does clarify youth cannot be detained on technical violations of probation, um, so any minor, minor violations. Also, it clarifies two motions to revoke can only be filed um, if probation is requesting that probation be revoked. If there is a new status or law violation case filed, um, or if there is a situation where the youth, um, there's reasonable cause to believe the youth will flee the jurisdiction or put the lives or property of others into danger. Uh, it provides that if the youth decides to participate in the graduated response, graduated sanction, um, and completes it, that violation is deemed to be resolved and cannot be used against that youth in subsequent proceedings. Uh, it also includes that in addition to the county attorney receiving um, reports requesting a probation revocation that the youth attorney also provi get provided with that report. If the youth at that time does not have an, a defense attorney, uh, probation is to notify the court and counsel shall be appointed for the youth. Um, as far as, so there's a question here that came on what are minor or technical violations of probation. Um, so those would be uh, violations of probation that do not rise to the level of a new status or law violation. It's not a new offense. Uh, it's a curfew violation. It's a um, possibly a failed UA, UA test or something that doesn't rise to the level of a new, new law violation. Um, as far as the incentives, uh, one thing that is important to note is that once the probation term is completed, if that probation has not been revoked, uh, the youth is relieved of any court orders that are still on here, and uh, the court is to initiate sealing procedures um, as provided within the, the juvenile code. And like I said, too, that section summary helps uh, kind of break it down, um, but there's still the provision if that youth is going to flee the jurisdiction or the property or lives of others are in danger, then the youth can be taken into custody by probation. The youth is entitled to detention hearing and that motion to revoke um, probation can be filed. This is dealing with those technical minor um, violations of probation. Uh, LB10, uh, this uh, affects primarily Douglas County or at increases the number of juvenile court judges in Douglas County um, from five to six. Uh, this one was approved by the governor and also was passed with an emergency clause. As Sarah said at the beginning of the webinar, um, all bills that were passed with an emergency clause go into effect immediately upon the governor signing it. So this bill has already been Going, in, going into motion, uh, 19 uh, attorneys submitted their names for the new um, open judgeship in Douglas County, and there's a public hearing on June 28th in courtroom 412 um, in regards to those um, 19 people who submitted their name. LB11, this is also introduced by Senator Chris, um, deals with the timing of appeal on orders to transfer either to or from juvenile court, between juvenile court and criminal court. Um, there was a, some Nebraska Supreme Court rulings that said that an order affecting where the case will be heard, whether in juvenile court or criminal court, um, 
was not a substantial right. Um, and so this bill is in response to that. It puts into statute that it is a, there is a statutory right to immediately appeal any orders transferring a case to or from uh, juvenile court. Um, that can be filed by, by the youth, by their attorney, or by the county attorney. Um, so you don't have to wait for the whole case, either criminal case or juvenile court case, to be um, adjudicated or they're found guilty in criminal court, but you can immediately um, file that appeal to determine whether transfer was appropriate. Um, next is uh, LB428. Um, it was parts of LB427 were amended into it. This was Senator Vargas's um, bills that focused on pregnant and parenting students within our schools. Um, the first thing it does is it requires schools to make accommodations for students who are breastfeeding. Uh, so that includes a safe, sanitary, private place where they can um, express themselves, and then also uh, places where they can store, store the milk. And these mere um, accommodations that employers have to make across the board um, for employees that they have who are breastfeeding. This also requires the State Department of Education and uh, school boards to implement policies to um, ensure accommodations are made to support pregnant and parenting teens. Um, the State Department of Education is going to develop a, a model policy that the school boards can, can draw from, uh, but what they are to address in it is their absenteeism policies, um, their how they can provide alternate coursework for youth who are pregnant or parenting, and also identify quality child care uh, providers that are in their area that the, the youth can uh, utilize uh, upon their return to school. And so that one was also approved by the governor and so will go into effect, as Sarah said, August 23rd. They have to let them in if they're pregnant too, don't they? Sorry. Sorry, was there a question? If you have a question, type it into the chat box. We'll try and try to address them. But Okay, I can take it from here. I think Great. we've got yes. Yeah. So um these are the carryover bills. So um we're gonna go over several bills that these are not bills that passed. These are bills that were introduced this session that are still either in committee or on the floor. Um, and so as a reminder, um, all of this is listed in the chart in the file section under the first one, the chart with the final action. Um, so I, there's quite a few on child welfare that I'll try to go through quickly here. Um, the first is LB 108, and that was introduced by Senator Crawford. It addresses issues related to children of incarcerated parents. So under the bill, beginning um, July 1st, 2018, it would require police departments, county sheriffs, and state patrol to establish guidelines for law enforcement officers to ensure child safety upon the arrest of a parent or guardian, including ensure that the, ensuring that the officers inquire whether the arrestee has children and procedures for the arrangement of temporary care of those children. The bill would also entitle a parent to make two phone calls at no expense at booking for the purpose of arranging child care if the arresting person is identified as a custodial parent or guardian's responsibility for minor children. LB 108 would also require the pre-sentence report to include whether and how children could be impacted by sentencing, and then the bill would require the Department of Corrections to establish policies to support and encourage relationships between parent and between a parent and a ch and children during incarceration, including adopting child-friendly visitation policies, including permitting age-appropriate physical contact for children under 13, um, collaborating with HHS to support visitation of a parent um, or guardian by a state ward if in the child's best interest. And then there's a comment that nothing in this um, section supersedes policies to protect child victims from visiting or interacting with an inmate of the child who was a victim of a crime for which the inmate is incarcerated. That bill, this bill remains um, in Judiciary Committee. However, 
Center Pansy and Brooks introduced uh, an interim study, LR198, to examine the impact of incarceration on children in Nebraska and best practice policies um, for supporting the parent-child relationship while the parent is incarcerated. So that interim study may provide additional information or momentum to this bill. And the next one is LB-179. That was introduced by Senator Kate Bowles. It would expand the Bridge to Independence program to youth who age out of juvenile probation. So Bridge to Independence is a program of extended service and support to age 21 to youth who age out of foster care. This would extend it to, um, again, juvenile, pro juvenile justice youth. Um, so under the bill, it would ex provide that opportunity for um, youth who are in a court-ordered out-of-home placement on their 19th birthday and then have received a court order in the six months prior to their 19th birthday that is contrary to the welfare of the juvenile to remain in his or her family home. And that was an attempt to focus the program on youth who did not have a safe home, JJ youth, who did not have a safe home to return to, but the language was carefully drafted to avoid an indirect finding of parental unfitness since parents and JJ cases have not been adjudicated. So the procedure under the bill um, for this would be that children who are adjudicated under subs 1, 2, or 3B and who are in a court-ordered out-of-home placement in the six months prior to age 19 would be required to receive information about the British Independence Program and the Office of Probation would be required to identify such youth then any party to the juvenile court case or the court upon its own motion could request a hearing in the six months prior to the youth turning 19 for the court to consider whether it's necessary for the juvenile to remain in out-of-home placement if the requesting party or court believes it would be contrary to the juvenile's welfare to return to the family home. Then the bill provides some factors for the court to consider in finding whether or not the return to the family home would be contrary to the welfare, including whether the juvenile is disconnected from family support, whether the juvenile faces a risk of homelessness upon closure of the case, whether probation has made reasonable efforts to return the juvenile to the family home prior to his or her 19th birthday. Um, and then the court is required to set forth those findings in a written order, and if such findings are made, um, then probation must notify HHS within 10 days after the finding, and then HHS work with the youth to avoid a lapse in services, um, and HHS would then proceed um, pursuant to the Bridge to Independence Act. So, um, again, um, this was a result of a lot of work by the, there's a uh, task force under the Bridge to Independence Advisory Committee under the Nebraska Children's Commission, and in response to significant stakeholder input that we need more transition services for JJ youth. Um, this bill currently remains on the Health and Human Services Committee. And next we have LB 189 that was introduced by Senator Howard. That was, this was an appropriations bill that would have appropriated um, about $1 million during the biennium for the purpose of providing HHS the specific resources to meet caseload standards that are, were set out in statute in 2012. This was in part uh, a response to the Office of Inspector General's report, which for the past, since the past four years has found Nebraska out of compliance with um, statutory caseload standards and you know, some pretty alarming um, investigation into 22 cases um, that resulted in the death or serious injury of children in care and citing caseloads as a factor leading to the outcome in many of those cases. Um, so that's a, this is a really critical issue right now and one that remains. Um, the bill did not advance. I know that's something that is you know, felt profoundly by the families and professionals working in that system. And to that end, Senator Howard's introduced an interim study, which is LR236, to examine workload studies and to continue to, um, to, to gather information about this issue. Um, I, want to, I hear a little bit of background noise. I just want to give a reminder, if I could. I'll jump into Kelly's role here. Um, just to make sure everyone is, has their phones on mute so we don't hear you wrestling around, if you could please. Okay. And then, thank you. LB226 was introduced by Senator Wishart. Um, it's intended to increase access to driver's license for youth in care. This is something that we've heard is a big issue for many young people. Um, LB226 would require HHS to provide information and assistance about kind of the process of obtaining a driver's license as part of transition planning. 
um, to young people, including things like providing them with a copy of the driver's manual, helping them identify driver's ed courses and resources to do that. Um, the bill is also intended to encourage foster parents to help youth in their care act as a driver's license. So the bill, um, as introduced, clarifies that a foster parent can give for permission for youth in their care to get a license. There was some, this was to address some confusion about whether youth need a caseworker signature, but under existing statute, parental permission is not required for any youth. So there was an, uh, an amendment prepared to clarify that there was no additional requirements in this regard for foster youth. Um, the bill would also provide liability protection for caregivers, so similar to the liability protection um, in federal law, the Federal Strengthening Families Act, and um, for caregivers in making reasonable and prudent parent standard decisions, LB 225 would clarify that caregivers are not liable for harm caused to or by a child who obtains a learner's permit or a driver's license um, by the act of the caregiver assisting them in doing so, if, so long as the caregiver is acting within the reasonable and prudent parent standard. Um, it also directs the Normalcy Task Force to examine the costs and benefits of um, finding some solutions to the issue of access to insurance, like type of insurance pools, which um, some other states have implemented for youth in foster care. This bill um, remains in Judiciary Committee, and I just want to note that Appleseed is doing a webinar, actually on Thursday of this week in two days, um, June 22nd, for attorneys. Um, on the issue of foster youth access to driver's license, and that's it from 12 to 1. Um, if you're interested in participating in that, you can just email me directly and we'll send over the information about that webinar, again, on foster youth access to driver's license. And then we have LB 398 that was introduced by Senator Justin Wayne. The bill would require the application of the Nebraska Rules of Evidence at termination of uh, parental rights proceedings. Um, and prohibit the consideration of evidence which is inadmissible in criminal proceedings at TPR. Um, this bill also remains in the Judiciary Committee. And then finally, I think it's my last one. Uh, nope, I've got a couple more. <laughs> uh, but LB 411 was introduced by Senator Kate Bowles. It makes some clarifications to the existing sibling placement and visitation statute. So LB 411 would clarify that the reasonable efforts requirement for placement visitation or other ongoing interaction applies even if the children, the siblings, have had no pre-existing relationship. And this is an issue in a number of circumstances, but namely when an infant sibling, with infant sibling, with an infant sibling, um, where essentially there's no pre-existing relationship, and also um, in adoption and other situations. So um, LB 411 would also require HHS to send copies of placement change notice to known siblings and then also to file a sibling placement report um, every six months or at the, essentially the 43-285 review intervals. Um, the sibling report would include information, including the reasonable efforts that HHS is taking to locate the child siblings. If a joint sibling placement is made, whether the placement continues to be consistent with the safety or well-being of the children. And then if joint sibling placement is not possible, the report shall include the reasons why the placement is and continues to be contrary to the safety or well-being of any of the siblings, and HHS is continuing reasonable efforts to place with a sibling or to facil facilitate visitation. So a report that would document those reasonable efforts, essentially, for placement, um, so that that could be considered as part of the review hearings on placement. Um, LB 411 would also grant a right to intervene to siblings for the limited purpose of seeking placement, visitation, or other ongoing interaction and specifically permit any other party um, who has intervened and whose substantial rights have been affected by a final order to appeal such order. Um, and then finally, the bill um, has a clarification that it's not to be construed to subordinate the rights of a foster or adoptive parent to the rights of the parents of the sibling or the rights of an adoptive foster or bio parent to the rights of the child seeking placement or visitation. This bill did advance to general file with a, judicial, with a committee, judiciary committee amendment. That amendment clarified that a parent um, or adult sibling can be given the option of refusing to receive that notice of placement change if they don't want to, and then specifically required juvenile courts to make a reasonable efforts finding regarding sibling placement and visitation or other ongoing interaction and whether such 
placement, visitation, or other ongoing interaction is contrary to the safety or well-being of any of the siblings, as, in, as is currently required by federal law, just to make sure that those findings are happening. Okay, and then I think this is the last one. Um, LB658, again introduced by Senator Justin Wayne, um, would establish a right of a parent, guardian, or custodian during an adjudication or disposition proceeding pursuant to the juvenile code to have appointed one expert witness where whose reasonable fees and expenses shall be paid by the county if the parent is indigent. Um, and the bill would also require the report of any evaluations of a juvenile ordered as part of an adjudication or disposition proceeding to be made available to all parties at least 15 days prior to the hearing. Um, and this bill remains in the Judiciary Committee as well. And with that, I'll turn it over to Christine for a few juvenile justice bills that um, did not uh, pass the session. Thank you, Sarah. And there are not as many interim juvenile justice bills as um, as child welfare bills, so Sarah definitely had the heavier burden there in preparing those slides. Um, but I do want to highlight some of these ones that will be carried over into the next session. Um, the, the big one uh, that we're following, and, and Voices for Children, as well as LB 158, which was Senator Panzenberg's priority bill um, this session, um, that provided access to counsel in juvenile proceedings. It extended the automatic appointment of counsel for youth across the state. Uh, currently, it's only applicable in Douglas, Lancaster, and Sarpy counties. Um, and so that remains on, on general file um, with it being kind of a tight budget year as well. There were some discussions about the, the costs associated with this. Um, and so I know in the, the interim, there's you know, a lot of people trying to put their heads together to figure out how we can protect this constitutional right of, of youth. And so it'll be coming back next year. The legislature did pass a, a legislative resolution, um, which does not have the force and effect of law, um, but they did pass a resolution 151, um, 31 to nothing, commemorating the, the right of youth to have counsel in juvenile proceedings and pledging to acknowledge and redress um, disparities in representation, uh, access to due process and decision making in the juvenile court. Um, so, so we are we did make some some progress there. Voices for Children did a great job putting together some data showing the disparate rates of appointment across the state, uh, showing the need for this. That uh, depending on where a youth is living, uh, sometimes determines whether or not um, they have equal access to counsel. Uh, LB 434, Senator Epke's. Um, it was use of video conferencing in juvenile court proceedings. Uh, that remains in the Judiciary Committee. As written, it was very broad. Um, it would apply to any hearing, whether it be an evidentiary hearing, so a detention hearing, a, an adjudication, a disposition, basically any juvenile court hearing, it eliminated the requirement um, that all the parties have to stipulate to the use of video conferencing. Um, it did have the provision there that it would have to be done in a manner that ensures that the due process rights of all parties are preserved. I think that was where the um, conflict was, is how to um, balance that due process with, with the, the party being affected, not being able to object to the use of video conferencing. Uh, so there's work to remain done on that. Obviously, it's a useful tool and can be utilized, but we have to make sure it's utilized in a way that protects um, people's rights. Uh, so then moving on to LB556, that was one that Sarah and Juliet had highlighted in the, the first legislative webinar way at the in January, the beginning of the session. Um, under that bill, it, it created a new felony offense um, of a juvenile offender. Uh, in possession of a, um, to simulate a, a fake gun. There were some concerns with that, um, abusing a, a juvenile court adjudication against a child um, or young adult later on in juvenile court. Um, 
there wasn't any provision of, well, what if that record has been sealed? Um, and we have a rehabilitative court system, so how can we use a, a juvenile adjudication against them to enhance um, or to punish them further in criminal court? So that bill was placed on general file, but it was placed on um, general file with the amendment that came out of the Judiciary Committee, AM 664, which specifically removed that new juvenile offender felony offense. So as with the amendment, that LB 556 just creates the offense of use of a, of a fake firearm to commit a felony and eliminates that use of a new felony possession of a firearm by a prohibited juvenile offender. Um, LB 595, that was Senator Groney's bill that was also highlighted in the first legislative um, seminar. There were, um, it provides for the use of physical restraint or removal from a class in response to student behavior. Um, there were some concerns from advocacy groups that it did not address um, access to meaningful resources to address student behavior, and it gave it extensive discretion um, to the teacher without really any parameters within which to use it. Um, also allowed the, the teacher to remove the youth from the classroom and even if the school administrator wanted to return the uh, school to the classroom, the teacher could override the administrator's request. So that is also remains on general file. There are a number of amendments um, that are pending on this bill, so that is just another one to watch as we come back for the next session. Um, so now we kind of move it on to the interim studies. Again, the full interim studies that we're following are included in a handout. Um, so we just wanted to highlight two of them here. And Sarah, if you want to take the first one. Oh, sure. Um, so that we wanted to mention, just I think one of these here, um, on the child welfare side, LR139 was introduced by Senator Bowles, um, and the purpose is to analyze the best use of the state's child welfare resources in line with its goals, including how Nebraska currently funds the child welfare system, including the use of state, philanthropic, and federal funding streams, and sustainability and variability by region of the state and over time. Um, this has been assigned to the Appropriations Committee, and it's timely, I think, given the, the budget cuts that we're seeing this year and that we discussed. Um, and in particular, I think there may be a look at, as, it's, as the interim study says, the sustainability and variability by region of the state over time. There were some increases um, in the Eastern Service area that were mirrored cuts across the state, and so I think um, I would expect maybe some examination of making sure that we have enough resources and the resources and services that we have um, in, in greater Nebraska. Um, and with that, I'll turn it back to back over to Christina for the juvenile justice in our city. Yeah, so I just wanted to highlight LR 216, which is brought by Senator Pansingbrook, um, really to look into our current uh, confidentiality laws regarding juvenile records and also our current ceiling laws. Um, in regards to, to juvenile court, um, seeing how, how the current laws are working, and then also to examine best practices, what other jurisdictions are, are doing, and ways that we can enhance and improve our systems to, to protect youth and help give them a, a good step forward um, as they move out of juvenile court. I also wanted to just touch briefly, and it's not an interim study, just something to keep in mind. Um, the, there was federal money that states could use to um, plan, operate, and evaluate projects focusing on improving a juvenile justice system in the form of Title II formula grants. Um, Nebraska has chosen not to participate in this program this year um, for a variety of reasons, um, a lot of, of administrative costs that were involved with it. But I, I wanted to note, too, that Part of those, those formula grants was the Crime Commission would monitor the four core requirements of the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Act, um, which includes the reduction of dis, 
uh, disparate minority contact within the juvenile justice system, removal of youth from adult jails, separation of youth from adults in secure facilities, and um, deinstitutionalization, criminalization of status offenses. Um, so now that we're not participating um, in those grants, we don't currently have a monitoring body to make sure we're in compliance with those um, important requirements. It's something we need to be um, cognizant of and um, vigilant going forward. Um, and then there's our contact information. We've got, uh, feel free to email me if you have any questions on any of the juvenile justice. I'm not as uh, well versed as Sarah on the child welfare side. Um, <laughs> Ditto. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> and we have like a couple minutes if there's any questions. We want to thank um, Deb and Kelly and Court Improvement um, for giving us the opportunity. As Christian said, we're always happy to answer any questions about this as time goes on, even during next session. So. Hang on to our email addresses and feel free to reach out. Um, oh, it looks like we're getting a question, so hang on. We'll take it. Still type quickly. <laughs> In the um, as we're waiting for Jill to type her question, I want this is Deb with Court Improvement, and I wanted to just uh, thank both Christine and Sarah for their time and. Um, it looks like Jill has her question up there, so I'll let you guys go ahead and answer. Yeah, so this is a bill related to the video conferencing, um, if it would assist with qualified expert witness testimony in ICWA cases. Um, as written, I mean, parties can already utilize video conferencing. It just requires that the parties agree um, to the use of the video conferencing. Um, so it's already a tool that parties can use. Um, I think the, this particular bill was in response to um, wanting to use video conferencing in, in detention hearings over the objection of the youth as kind of a cost-saving initiative um, by the county. But Sarah, I don't know if you want to weigh in on that as well. No, I would agree. <laughs> no, thank you. Thanks yeah. for being on, too. <laughs> okay, well thank you so much again for your um, time and attending this webinar. I did want to do a quick plug for an upcoming webinar that we are hosting on July 15th from noon to 1. And it will uh, be experts from uh, Redwood Toxicology Laboratory will be providing content related to best practice in best practice in drug testing, prevalence of drugs, and frequency for testing. And so we will be sending out an invitation for that for people to sign up for that webinar. As a reminder, uh, this webinar will be posted onto our website, onto the Court Improvement Project website um, in the next couple of weeks. And um, I'm sure that if there are additional questions Sarah and Christine will be open to answering those at any time. But again, thank you all for attending. And Christine and Sarah, thank you for sharing um, your very valuable knowledge about legislation um, that passed and upcoming potential legislation for the future related to child welfare and juvenile justice. So thanks so much, and have a great day, everyone.